you shouldn't always be trying to get ready for the moment where you, you know, you've got to execute at work or you, you know, you got to execute in a game. It's the culmination of always being ready so that when that moment shows up, you can define it and that moment doesn't define you. Everyone's talking about the metaverse these days, but workplace from meta is different. I mean, the clue's in the name, right? Workplace is a business communication tool that uses features like instant messaging and video calls to help people share information. Think Facebook, but for your company. It's part of Meta's vision for the future of work, a future in which your job isn't just something you do, but something you experience. And if you've been listening to this show, you know that experience is something that I am very passionate about and talk about a lot. Workplace from Meta is creating a future in which we'll all feel more present, connected, and productive. You can learn more and start your journey into the future of work at workplace.com forward slash future. Again, that's workplace.com forward slash future. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Leading the Future of Work. My guest today, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney, best-selling author of Fly Into the Wind, How to Harness Faith and Fearlessness on Your Ascent to Greatness, and he's also the founder of Folds of Honor. Dan, thank you for joining me. Oh man, blessed to be with you, Jacob. Congrats on uh, hosting an awesome podcast and all the guests you've uh, you've had on it. So I feel humbled to be included. Oh, flattery is the best way to start any episode. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, why don't we get started with a little bit of background information uh, about you uh, for people who are not familiar with you or your work. Why don't you take us even way back to how you were raised uh, as a kid and how did that bring you to where you are now? Yeah, so um, I call them moments of synchronicity or chance with a purpose, and we'll probably get into that because I'm I'm kind of a Star Wars geek too, and I just believe in this force that's always around us, right? It's omnipresent. It's um, something that if you harness and recognize it, you can piece significant moments together in your life, but also the little moments that occur every day. And going all the way back for me, so I was born and raised in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Son of a college professor, taught at Oklahoma State University. And I was 12 years old and I had my first like defining moment of synchronicity on the golf course when I met my first fighter pilot. And his name is Steve Courtright. His call sign is Reno. And I remember meeting this guy and he might as well have walked out of the movie The Right Stuff. I mean, he's about 6'2", steely blue eyes, good looking dude. And he was 40 and I remember I'm 12 and I'm like, you can be grown up and this cool. And he was like, yeah, man, and, and you want to drink in my Bud Light? And that was it, right? My first man crush. I'm like all in and I remember playing golf a couple days later with my dad and I'm like, hey, dad, I, I know what I want to do with my life. I want to be a golf pro and a fighter pilot. And his response to me was was pretty interesting. And you mentioned the book, but uh, he said, son, can you tell me which way an airplane takes off? And I'm like, ah, I think it's into the wind. He said, yeah, man, that's exactly right. Obviously, preparing this 12-year-old kid for the inevitable headwinds that would stand between me and this very unlikely dream. I mean, so unlikely. I, I'm a rare bird, only guy in the history of the world to be a golf pro and a fighter pilot. Um, but he really had no idea how God would, you know, take those things forward and, you know, grew up and, you know, leave it to Beaver household and spent a bunch of time on the golf course playing sports, but was good enough to, to head north to the University of Kansas to, uh, to play college golf. And uh, that's kind of my upbringing. Yeah, very cool. And how did you actually get to become a fighter pilot? And what was that process like as far as the, the schooling, the training? And do you remember the first time you sat in, uh, you were flying F-16s, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, still uh, still flying in the Air Force. I'm um, an old dude. Uh, but uh, yeah, and you know, to be a fighter pilot is an extraordinary journey and a, and a gauntlet. I remember the very first day of, of training, you obviously got to get a college degree, which I did, and then you go to officer training and then you show up in, in pilot training. For me, it was in Wichita Falls, Texas, Shepard Air Force Base. Okay. 
And first day of class, there's 45 guys in there in just these spit-polished blue Air Force uniforms. And this steely-eyed colonel walks in, and he said, Hey, man, welcome to your boyhood dream. He was like, over the next two and a half years, we'll spend $8 million per pilot training you. Wow. And the realities are most of you showed up here and you want to be fighter pilots, but less than 5% will achieve that goal. And that doesn't mean you're going to wash out of the program. You can fly bombers or cargoes or tankers or whatever, but of the 45, you can do the math on that. You know, that's three or four people. That's crazy. And uh, I, uh, over this two and a half year period, really experienced three transformational lessons that I, that I love to share with people. The, the first one was day two when I realized that, you know, only 5% were going to make it. And that was my dream to be a fighter pilot. I started a routine that I have not stopped in 22 years. Uh, and that's how I start every day with prayer. So I try to beat the world out of bed, but that's my first thing, my cup of coffee. I get in the book. And uh, that's the greatest gift the Air Force has given me is is that routine that I probably would have never had if I hadn't faced a you know a task that was this yeah. big and overwhelming for a you know twenty five year old kid. And I guess for the for a lot of people, thing, even if you for a lot of people even if you're not religious, that could be like maybe your morning gratitudes or what you're thankful for or what you want to accomplish during the day. But it sounds like whatever it is, it's some routine or practice that kind of sets you up for the rest of the day. Yeah, I and mean, I couldn't agree more. And obviously, you know, for me, it's it's the big man and, uh, and saddling up with purpose to start the day and preparing for that day um, and not just waking up and letting the day take you wherever yeah. it might go. Having right? purpose in your day um, and planning it out, yeah. Yeah, and so that was lesson number one. Lesson number two, um, we have a very dangerous business and uh, you know, it's a business you can't get life insurance as a fighter pilot. Hmm. And there's a motto that, that I learned the second day of training, which is stay ready so you don't have to get ready. And again, to your point, Jacob, man, that translates really well to life, right? You, you shouldn't always be trying to get ready for the moment where you, you know, you've got to execute at work or you, you know, you got to execute in a game. It's the culmination of always being ready so that when that moment shows up, you can define it and that moment doesn't define you. And, in, you know, in our world, those moments can be life and death yeah. and you better not be trying to figure out what you're going to do when the airplane's on fire yeah. <laughs> or something else is happening. It's right. Kind of, uh, it reminds me of that, uh, the phrase, create your own luck where, you know, you don't just wait for something to happen, but you're always, um, you're always on the sideline preparing, just waiting to get put into the game. You're always practicing. You're showing up earlier than everybody else. You're, you're, you're always preparing and you're ready because at some point a moment will come and it usually does come for, uh, for a lot of people out there. And you don't want to have that moment come along and say, Oh my God, what do I do? You want to say, I'm ready. I've been waiting for this moment my whole life and I'm, you know, I'm going to crush it. Preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. Or in my case, preparation may save your butt. Yep. Right. Uh, as, as a fighter pilot. And, uh, so that was lesson number two. And then lesson number three, once you make it to the F-16, uh, which was out at Luke Air Force Base, you get four rides with an instructor and your fifth ride is solo um, or you wash out of the program. I remember wow. sitting in this, you know, it's just four rides million, and then fifth on your four, own Four rides, fifth ride solo or you're out of the program. Jeez. Um, so I'm sitting in this fifty five million dollar jet, which has a top speed of about Mach 2.5. That's 1,700 miles an hour. That's crazy. Uh, goes zero to 50,000 feet in under one minute, climbing straight up. It's called an unrestricted climb, but 90 degrees to the ground. I mean, this is an unbelievable machine. And there I am all by myself sitting in it. And uh, I'm like, hey, what the heck? So I hit start two, no keys required. Um, and I bet, Jacob, you could take off an F-16. You probably couldn't land one. I but anyway, I, I take off. to do either. Head. Yeah, I take off and I land and I, and I come back and I, I remember it like it was yesterday pulling into my my parking spot and I, I raise this bubble canopy on the F-16 and there's this cold wind that hits me and it's August in Phoenix, so it's like 140 out and you realize, dude, I've been in fight or flight literally for the last hour of my life. But as I unstrap from this jet, um, one of the most transformational moments of my life settled in and it's go before you're ready. And I, I talk about this in, in my book as, as well, but man, not, not only is it a life anthem for me, 
Uh, I would argue that if there was one piece of DNA that ties greatness together, that's it, man. And just go before you're ready. And and for me, it's I'm, I'm so fanatical about it. It's like the crazier the idea is, the the more certain I am that I have to go. But I I truly believe that the universe conspires for people that that just go and and have that reckless faith and the good stuff in life is out on the ragged edges and uh, you got to go out there and, and get it. And it's, you know, it's so many people are, are planning and I'm not saying that planning is a bad thing altogether, but if you're not careful, man, you can plan your life away. Yeah. Um, and having the courage and faith to listen to what's in your heart translated and in, in go before you're ready and not, figure everything out and certainly don't listen to all the people pontificating around you that'll try to make you a prisoner of common assumption and tell you the things you can't do or you can do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that was, those are my big three is, mm -hmm. is a fighter pilot that, I mean, I take with me each and every day, um, from training, learned a few more lessons on, on my three combat tours, but those were the foundational lessons as a fighter pilot. I love that. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about the F-16. So my dad actually worked, uh, works in the aerospace uh, industry and he actually worked on the F-22, um, mm -hmm. to help do some of the design stuff there. And he would tell me stories about that thing. And I've been to a couple of air shows and I think they had some F-16s and MIGs and stuff like that. I mean, they're amazing things to, to watch. Um, so one thing that I thought was really interesting that you mentioned is you get four tries with an instructor where they kind of show you everything. And then the fifth time you're on your own, which to me is very, very relevant to the leadership world, to the business world, because it's sort of like at some point you got to take the training wheels off. Uh, and at some point you as an employee or mid-level leader are going to have to take that chance and take that risk and, you know, to... To, to do things yourself. But what happens when you mess up? So for the people who wash out and they can't do that fifth um, fly on their own, what do they, I mean, do they like crash? I mean, do, can they not land? Like you're up there by yourself, right? I mean, what do you do if nobody can help you figure out how to get the plane down? Yeah, so you're not going to, yeah, they're not going to send you if you can't get the plane down, right? So it's called proficiency in those first four rides. Um, and you have to get signed off to go solo. And if you're not going to get signed off to go solo, then you ain't going solo. And those people may not wash out of the Air Force totally. They might get retracked and they go fly an air refueler or a bomber or something like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, that's why it's, you know, the most expensive, highest attrition rate of any training in the U S military. There's nothing even close, that's crazy. um, as far as, uh, as far as that goes, but, uh, yeah, 1700 miles an hour. So how many, how many G's does that put on your body? Well, the speed doesn't put any G's on your body. It's, it's when you, it's when you turn and you fight gravity. Uh, okay. um, so the F-16 is uh, a nine G sustainable wow. aircraft. And if you watch Top Gun 2, they were making a big deal about seven G's. Uh, so we're a nine G sustainable aircraft. And, and that feels like an elephant sitting on you. Uh, it is like, um, you know, playing NFL football and, you know, call the duty all at the same time. Uh, so it's very mental and very physically demanding. Um, so it's, 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 you know, it's really hard to describe, uh, other than, um, it's, you know, the greatest drug I've ever ingested in, in my life, the way you feel and how truly alive, yeah. um, you are flying a fighter pilot and just every one of your senses is kind of out operating at the highest level when, uh, when you're in that environment. Have you ever been flying where you lost control or maybe not all of your senses were firing the right way and did something bad happen as a result when you were maybe not present when you should have been? Yeah. So I, you know, I, I talk about it and fly into the wind, but I almost killed myself on a, a routine flight, which is, you know, complacency. I, I truly believe it's the devil's greatest um, weapon against all of us, especially people that are, you know, you're successful, you've made it. Um, and you, you get comfortable. And for me, it was a, you know, it wasn't a combat sortie. It was just a typical sortie taken off at a Tulsa international. And, um, I, uh, I raised the gear about a half a second early and, and the jet and the way the controls are, the, 
on like a normal airplane where actually a pilot has to put the flaps up. This is all computerized. And so when you actuate the gear, the flaps come up on the aircraft. But I wasn't quite far and away from the ground. And the jet actually settled back down on the 370-gallon fuel tank wow. on the bottom of the airplane, external tank. And uh, unbeknownst to me, I had no idea I did it. And I come back around and, and I fly, um, land, and they put gas in the airplane. They call me out. And they're like, hey, man, check this out. And I had just scraped the bottom of the tank. And so gas was dripping out. And, you know, based on the all the metrics on the airplane, and it's super smart. So they pull the tapes and, and look at it. You know, another quarter of a second, that tank ruptures and blows up underneath me. Um, and, uh, just a, you know, total mistake on, on my part. And, you know, I, I talk about this in my book flying to the wind, but it was, it was that moment that was insidious, but it was like, it, it lit off a life storm for me that lasted like 10 years, hmm. um, where the view of, you know, myself, and I would say it's very dangerous to tie your identity to what you do. And what you do when it becomes who you are, that is a fragile place to operate in this world, man. Mm. Um, and uh, it was a succession of a lot of things that uh, that kicked off in my life that got so bad that, you know, three years later, I end up having to quit being a fighter pilot, which was my boyhood dream. And uh, thankfully, you know, three years after that, I would be able to get back in, have a mulligan, if you will, and, and get back in the Air Force and, and fly again. But, um, you know, our lives are defined by what we do when it doesn't go our way. Yeah. And I don't know if uh, everybody listening is out there like me or not, but that happens multiple times a day. Um, but I, you know, and I think, too, sometimes you got to walk in the desert by yourself, not to get too deep into this. But um, the things you learn and struggle and when your ego just, you know, gets multiple gut punches, um, it's not fun in the moment, but it's a real blessing especially as you evolve as a leader and the humility required to, I think, lead effectively. Yep. Uh, and I'm proud to be the most broken guy that walks into every room, whether I'm leading in the military or I'm leading at Folds of Honor and, and share my shortcomings, the struggles that I've had. Uh, and it has an, an incredible impact on, on bringing people together because uh, everybody's struggling. That's the common denominator yep. of humanity. So a couple of questions and maybe we can, you can share a little bit about that story and, and what happened. But before we get into that, uh, you mentioned something important, which is complacency and, and why that is such a danger and why it was such a danger for you. But I also want to talk a little bit about why it's such a danger for people inside of organizations, for business leaders, just for, uh, for us in general. Um, because it seems like a lot of people struggle with that. They get into that routine of like, I'm comfortable, I'm good. Like, I'm going to show up to work. I know what my day is going to look like. I know the meetings that I'm like, I, it's, it's routine. Why is that such a dangerous thing for us? Complacency and, and just being comfortable all the time. And how do you get out of it? Well, yeah. And, I, and I'll tell a story, right? Cause nobody cares about pontification, but a story for me, I, I remember flying a, a combat mission on my second tour of duty in Iraq. And I was an alert pilot flying at night and I was supporting Navy SEALs, special operators. And we had a tick, which is called a troops in contact. So basically, you know, our guys are fighting for their life in close proximity. And they bring um, me and another F-16 um, into the fight because we're a very violent weapon system. I say, you know, we turn stuff into pink mist, man. We we show up and, and kill bad guys and save good guys. That's our job. And But I remember um, sitting in a very comfortable room, just chilling out. And the the horn sounds, the alert horn, which is a, which launches us, lets us know, hey, we're getting into the fight. And we'll be airborne in seven minutes at that point. But running to the jet, um, one of the things that I learned as a fighter pilot is that, you know, courage and comfort can never coexist. Mm -hmm. um, and that translated, these, these courageous moments are when we're growing comfortable moments are either you're sedentary or you're you're going backwards yeah and it, it goes back to your question of of complacency and i i truly believe that that that's the the devil's greatest weapon on on the walk and especially as 
you get through these phases in life and, you know, a lot of young people starting out, you're kind of in this fight or flight, right? Man, yep. I got to make it. I got to figure it out. And then you get to this point where it's like, hey, I'm okay, right? I got a house. I got a couple of nice cars. I got a family. My life is stable. I'm going to take a deep breath, translate it. I'm going to stop growing. I'm not, I don't have to work as hard. I don't have to use my talents at the level I used to um, because I've made it. And, I, you know, that is... It's so hard and it's so real. And then you combine that with the fact, Jacob, we live in a world that's trying to make you comfortable. Yeah. Right, man. Look at your iPhone and Netflix and the food that'll show up at your front door and you can spend a day in your house and do nothing and be fully entertained in this binge oriented world that that we live in. And so you're fighting against this force that's trying to make you comfortable. And I think number one is you gotta be aware of it. Uh, and number two is I live by routine. I live by a code each and every day to make sure that I don't fall prey to, ah, oh, man, I'm comfortable. I don't have to work today. Life is, life's so good. Hmm. What's, um, maybe you can share a little bit about what that code is and how can people get out of that zone of complacency? So let's say you, you have a full-time job, maybe you're a leader, maybe you're an individual contributor, and you feel like you're in that cycle, right? That hamster wheel where the days feel the same, the work feels the same, and, you know, it's not like you're miserable, but you're just kind of like, eh, you know, like, I'm, I'm good. How do you break out of that? Well, I mean, I think that everybody, the, the days are the same, right? The, the work's going to be the same. I mean, that, that, that's life. Right. You're going to look at your calendar. Everybody's going to have more to do than they have time to do it right now. Yeah. That is a given. Like that's the world we live in. And but to flip that on its on its head, living every day with with a purpose and controlling every day. And I'm going to, you know, dive into my my book here because because I outline that and my code of living, I call it CAVU which is a fighter pilot acronym. It stands for Ceiling and Visibility Unlimited. Obviously, those are the perfect steel blue sky days to go fly a fighter jet. But for me, I live Cavu. Every day is an unlimited gift, but it's based on our choices. And I think most people agree the sanctity of the day is, is lost. You mentioned yeah. it, right? They just run into another. But we also understand that tomorrow is guaranteed to no one. And so how do you make sure that your choices on a daily basis culminate to write the legacy that you want in your life. Um, and for me, I've got, you know, 10 lines of effort basically every day that, that I do with, without fail. Right. Um, and you know, that starts, I talked about one, it's, you know, beating the world out of bed. Um, and I get up and I have my coffee and I'm in the Bible. What time do you wake up in the morning? And then I work out. It depends. About six. And it's gotten a little okay. later as I've gotten older. But I'm good with it. And I've studied. Man, I'm going to be 50 years old. And they're like, hey, you, you need more sleep. You're not performing at the highest level that I was when I was 40. And I you know, I get it. I'm not going to fight that and make myself miserable. Um, but planning out each and every day um, so that you know that you're executing. And that's taking care of yourself physically, spiritually, and emotionally every day, regardless of what is on your calendar. And I think that's when people really get behind the power curve. I call it the EM curve. Like we only have so much energy in our life, so you have to manage that energy. And if you're waking up and just jumping into the fight every day and looking at your calendar and be like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. It's out of my control. Um, you're not going to be fulfilled. Uh, you're going to wake up 10 years from now, which we all will, right? Um, and say, wow, what happened to that 10 years versus intentionally living every day and waking up in 10 years knowing exactly what you did for the last 10 years because I do the same thing basically six or seven days a week. It depends. I might give myself a day off. Um, but And the other part about this, so Jocko is a good a, a friend of mine, you know, in the circle, and I, I'm going to steal this from him. But he talks about the difference between discipline and motivation. Dude, every one of us is going to ride an emotional roller coaster of motivation. Some days you're happy, some days you're sad. You can't control it. Yeah. But you can be disciplined every day to have a mind that is stronger than your emotions. 
And yeah, you definitely learn that as a, as a fighter pilot. I mean, you're in battle and there's crazy stuff going on. People are fighting for their lives on the ground. You're getting shot at in the air and your emotions are going crazy, but you have a disciplined and structured plan by which you execute the mission. And I just translated that um, to my life. And that's different for everybody, right? But yeah. you have to have a plan that orbits around your priorities in life or the world will, uh, will steal it from you. Workplace is a business communication tool from Meta. Think Facebook, but for your company. It's part of Meta's vision for the future of work. A future in which we'll all feel more present, connected, and productive. Start your journey into the future of work at workplace.com forward slash future. Again, that's workplace.com forward slash future. What was the most uh, high pressure or scary situation you've ever been in as far as combat? And you were telling actually a story, I think, before we transitioned to this, how you were supporting uh, some of your SEALs. Um, or some, yeah, um, there, there are a lot, right. And I would say these stories require a beer, which, which we don't have right now. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, on, on that mission I launched, um, and we had two ground battles in Iraq. They were simultaneously just on fire and in, in Fallujah and Ramadi, there'd been a big dust storm. It's called a shamal that had blown through. So visibility was really low. And, uh, um, I was getting ready to launch for this mission, Jacob, and and just so, I mean, you're so nervous, right? You are so hyped up, and I'm sitting on the runway, and I'm typing in coordinates and all the stuff because we're going to be supersonic headed to this fight, and, and people's lives are depending on me doing my job. Yeah. And in a crazy, scary way, those are the most empowering moments of your life when you realize that as a single seat fighter pilot, nobody's coming to help me. So it was a single right? seat. I, you didn't have a co-pilot in any of them. Oh no, I'm single seat fighter pilot, air to air, air to ground, wow. F-16s. Yeah. So nobody's going to come help me. Um, I've been trained for this, and if I don't execute at the highest level, people can lose their lives. And when you get to that life or death place, and it your performance depends on it um and you go out and you execute that is a incredibly empowering yeah. thing and the more you do it the more confidence you have that wow um i can go do this and i don't want to downplay a team right or the people in your life supporting you but when you really think about it you know you come into this world by yourself and you leave this world by yourself and there is a rampant lack of accountability in the culture that we live in now. Um, and you got to take ownership because, I mean, God creates all of us in his image with a unique mission. Uh, and are you performing at that at that highest level? But those were the most nerve wracking moments as a fighter pilot and, and I was never worried about myself right and it's it's crazy in our culture people would say man I'd rather die than screw up hmm. and that can be unhealthy um, as well but when you know people's lives are depending on you executing your job it really flips the script and it's all about them um, and uh, you grow and you grow in tremendous ways when yeah. You understand that, man, I got to go do this by myself. Um, I don't need permission. Nobody's going to help me. And you go execute. Uh, those are game changing moments on the walk. So it was that feeling when you were having to take off and that, that dust storm was going on. That was a very impactful moment for you. Yeah. And, you know, and, that, and that's one example of, of many. Um, but going out there and just knowing the severity of the consequence yeah. uh, if you make a mistake, if you, as it goes back to stay ready so you don't have to get ready. If I'm trying to get ready for that mission sitting on the end of the runway and we got guys on the ground that are fighting for their lives, I mean, what a disservice that would be. Mm -hmm. um, so you are ready for that moment. You go out there and you execute but it's the, you know, the scariest moments of my life, not worried about myself dying, but doing something that would cost someone else their life because I made a mistake. Have you ever failed a mission? 
uh, not, 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 uh, not on any, not nothing like that, right? Never did anything that cost anybody their lives or didn't put a bomb on time on target. Um, we always fail, right? We come back and we'll debrief for two hours. Hey, could have done this better. Yeah, this, this could have been executed more expeditiously. That radio call wasn't any good. You know, we get into the weeds because when you're paying attention to like the smallest stuff, yeah. the big stuff you, you don't miss. I mean, we talk about, you know, when you check in on the radio, it is, you are on time, you are sounding right, you are in formation. All of these things that don't have anything to do with dropping a bomb or shooting an air-to-air missile, but the discipline that permeates the process, the end result is hopefully you're going to do the stuff that really matters at the highest level. There is a, a rumor that, or, you know, stereotype a lot of people when they think of the Air Force, the military, the SEALs, whatever, that uh, it's command and control. There is no room for vulnerability. You're supposed to be strong and tough and don't admit weakness. And this is why our companies are like that. Is that stereotype true? No. And, it, and I've talked about it. I mean, I, like, it's like, I, I am... And I will never downplay what you've achieved in life. So I don't want people to take this the wrong way, but I'd love to sit down and have a beer and talk about what you've overcome because that is the medal of a man or a woman, Um, not what they've achieved, um, but rather what do you do in the, in the storm um, of your life and uh, inside our inner circle. It's, 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 it is vulnerable. We trust each other with our lives uh, and this, you know, bravado, if you will, um, you know, I'm sure it exists some places, um, but we're one of the most high functioning teams, um, in the world is, is fighter pilots or SEALs or special operators. And within those teams, there is great trust. And in order for there to be great trust, you, you gotta be vulnerable, right? Yeah. Um, you yeah. just, you just do. Um, but as I said, I'm I'm way more interested in what people have overcome than the medals on their chest or the trophies um, yeah. on their wall because what you do in the storm, and we'll all be in a storm, right? Yep. Every one of us, and probably multiple storms in life, but what you do there is how you evolve, and that is what defines us. When you think about vulnerability or when we talk about vulnerability so it sounds like this is actually accepted and, and practiced and, and it was actually used and exhibited by, uh, by your team, by teams in different, um, whether it's SEALs or military army. Can you give an example of something like that? Like when did you have to ask for help or admit to a mistake or talk about a personal challenge or struggle, like to, to open up and connect with others on your team? Yeah, I touched on it before. It was, you know, one of the, the, the worst days of my life when I almost killed myself flying an F-16, making a stupid mistake and, you know, landing on the on the fuel tank and, you know, coming in and making that kind of almost life and death mistake in, in front of your team, in front of, you know, all the maintainers of the aircraft, um, all that. And uh, I... It was, you know, uh, thankfully I lived, right? But it was a big blow to the ego. And I'll never forget this. One of my guys I fly with, you know, Mike Scorsone called me up, said, hey, man, um, I know it's it's hard for you, but everybody knows you're one of the best pilots out here. You got to shake it off and push forward. Um, and uh, so they're, you know, daily examples. And I think one of the unique things, too, about the fighter pilot world is we don't hide our mistakes. Hmm. And when you show up to a debrief, uh, I'll have written down multiple things during the flight that I did that I knew I could have done better. And I share those. Yeah. Right. And that is, is how we get better. And if you're, you know, hiding your mistakes, hiding your vulnerability, I mean, good Lord, just turn into social media, right? It's, it's on the other guardrail um of that but we facilitated an environment that's not about being perfect it's about getting better yeah and the only way you get better is if you learn from your mistakes and we finish every debrief for a for a sortie we'll fly 
with lessons learned and the the uh, the flight lead will write them on the board, writes them all out. Hey, man, here are all the things that we could have done better. Not, hey, we're awesome. Let's go to the bar, have a beer. We're fighter pilots. It's yeah. never a perfect sortie. It's funny that um, mistakes are so openly talked about and discussed, yet as I'm sure you've seen in a lot of organizations, mistakes are oftentimes hidden. Like we don't you know, if we make a mistake, we try to hide it. We try to blame somebody else. We don't want to get in trouble. We don't want to get fired. And I'm always fascinated why the cultures are so different depending on where you look. For example, you look in the uh, the Navy, the Air Force, and mistakes are talked about openly. And in corporate cultures, they're oftentimes trying to uh, trying to hide them. Um, what advice do you have for leaders out there when it comes to vulnerability, when it comes to mistakes to be open and, and talk about these things? I mean, is it that simple where you just have a debrief after each project and every meeting and just say, Hey, let's talk about what we did wrong. Yeah, I think I, I would offer up two things. Um, one, you have to give your people permission to fail because that's when you max perform. Yeah. We call it bending metal in the fighter pilot business. You you don't want people not max performing for fear of failure or fear of yeah. mistake. Um, you have to make it okay to fail. And I'll never forget, you know, one of my instructor pilots flying the T-38, uh, Spike Thomas, and uh, he was an American hero. This guy punched out of his F-16 in Iraq, was an all-American. He's a Hall of Famer at the Air Force Academy football player. And the very first day he gave me a notebook and he was like, Hey, we're going to write down every mistake you make. And he was like, and you're going to do great. If before you come to work every day, you review those mistakes for the, for the whole, you know, six months. And we don't make those mistakes twice. And I, I'm always, you know, as a leader, I'm like, Hey man, the first one's free. And I don't care what it is. And when something's a mistake is made, I always look at myself as a leader first, like, hey, that probably wasn't communicated properly. Um, but creating an environment where failure is fine um, and also an environment where I would say, you know, if you've got problems, bring solutions because people, they hide problems too. Yeah. Um, and every organization is is dealing with stuff and making sure that you're always bringing um, solutions to uh, to those problems. And, you know, from a leadership perspective, I've, you know, I've 22 years in the Air Force. I've been through every leadership course the Air Force has to offer. They've spent millions of dollars on me from squadron officer school to air command and staff college to air war college. And the best leadership advice I have, you ready? Yep. Work, work hard, be nice. <laughs> and people make it way too difficult, right? They write these mission statements out. They put them on the front walls. They do all this. And you walk into most corporations, you ask them what the mission statement is. People will have no clue, especially as you scale, right? And for us, it's work hard, be nice. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have a day that you don't want to work hard, that's okay. Just be nice. Yeah. Um, and it's digestible. It's simple. Um, we understand what that means walking into the office and we're able to do extraordinary things on, you know, in the Air Force team, on the Folds team uh, with that simple model, work hard, be nice. I love that. I love that. Best leadership advice you've ever been given. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> best leadership advice people will take away. Um, yeah. Usually the last uh, 15 minutes or so, I like to focus on uh, specific action items that people can apply in, in, in their lives and inside of their careers. But before we jump into that, um, maybe we can end with one more story. You mentioned that something happened to you where you had to kind of bow out for a couple of years. It seems like you had to go through a, a, a struggle, a tough time. Are you able to share a little bit about what happened and what you learned and how you were able to overcome that tough time and, and get yourself back um, into being a fighter pilot? Yeah. So um, at the time, I, I talked about the accident in the F-16, and then I was building a golf course here in Tulsa called the Patriot. So 2008 hits. Um, and I woke up every day of my life for six years going bankrupt. Um, brutal, right? Financial pressure yeah. um, on me. During that six-year period, uh, most of the people in my life that were friends that you could count on vanished. Uh, trouble with, uh, you know going to the fridge way too often with alcohol, right? Trying to numb that stuff. 
that spills out into, you know, challenges with, within my own family. And then I got to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to get out of this storm anytime soon. Yeah. So stop trying that. What can I do with, within the confines of this storm? And out of that, um, I came up with Cavu and I'm like, I cannot control the world around me, but I can control at least some intentionality with each and every day to do the things that I know are making me a better person along the walk. And I, I call it parasitic drag, um, but it's all the stuff in your life that keeps you from breaking through. Uh, and and holding you back. And I started, and we only know that in the heart of our own hearts, you know, what is it that people are doing? Is it alcohol? Is it video games? Is it shopping? Is it pornography? I mean, who knows what it is, right? Um, but I'm like, I can, I can control this. So I started eliminating all of this parasitic drag um, in my life that regardless of where I was, on my walk, I knew at the end of the day, I'd made a little progress into becoming a better person in God's eyes. Um, And over that 10 year period, uh, I call it the walk in the desert, right? By myself, I walked out the other side, a completely different human being. And uh, I'll, I'll take it to the parable of, you know, the, when they're crossing the sea of Galilee in the Bible and Jesus is in the boat with the disciples and and uh, there's a huge storm that, that comes through and uh, they go wake him up and, and he's asleep, right? And they're like, we're going to die. We're going to die. And he's like, man, you have little faith. Um, and for me, that epiphany of realizing I'm in the storm, but I'm not alone. Yeah. Right. And we evolve in the challenging moments in our life and a paradigm flip for me during this 10 years and it goes back to being a fighter pilot is we always take off into the wind because we need resistance to ascend Mm. and i think our lives are exactly the same way when you stop thinking of it feeling sorry for yourself saying man this sucks it's not fun well life's not supposed to be fun all the time but god didn't put this in my life to keep me down he put this in my life to raise me up and prepare me for something much bigger uh, and I have no doubt, well, it was a horrible, sucky, suck factor high, as we call it in the fighter pilot world, time in my life. I'm so grateful now looking back that I went through it because I don't even know the person I was barely before that yeah. happened. And to lead folds, um, which, you know, we haven't talked about much and, you know, where it was in its infancy in that point to where we are now, which is 44,000 scholarships awarded to spouses and children who've had somebody killed or disabled, like $220 million out the door, um, just kicked off our campaign to support first responder families that have had someone killed or disabled with the gift of education. I would have never been prepared for this moment had I not gone through that moment. And the humility required to know that I've got nothing to do with it. But what I can do is get up, try not to be complacent every day, get in the fight and yeah. glorify God on the walk. Yeah, I like that message of uh, how to deal with those challenges and obstacles. Because you're right. I mean, everybody's going to face them. Uh, you know, a lot of people face those challenges at work and, um, you know, you got to get through them. Thanks again for tuning into my episode with Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney. Remember that if you subscribe to the show, you're going to get access to a bonus episode where Dan shares how he prioritizes information, how he balances routine with complacency, and the power of choice. The cost is only $4.99 a month, or if you want to save some money, you can subscribe for $49.99 a year, less than the cost of a cup of coffee a month. And you're going to get a ton of value out of the subscription because you will get a bonus episode each week, ad-free listening, and early access to new episodes. Not to mention you also get a chance to support the show. So I hope you decide to subscribe.